Nós vamos dar seguimento, é sucessivo mesmo, ao professor Joaquim Barrientos, que veio do México, não é? da Universidade uh, do UNAM. Uh, eu vou... rapidamente ler o seu currículo. Nós esquecemos na correria de dar as dandrola. Mas o professor uh, Barriendos é professor no Instituto de Investigações Estéticas, o NAM. Né? Já lecionou na Latin American Cultural Studies na Universidade de Columbia, em Nova York. Foi professor associado na Universidade de Barcelona e pesquisador como convidado no Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art de Paris. E entre suas publicações estão Geoestética e Transculturalidade, Global Circuits, Art, Geography and Global Challenge of Critical Thinking e Juan Acha, Despertar Revolucionário ou não. Quer vir, professor? Muito bem. Sim. Sim, sim. O professor Barriandos vai à sua palestra é Memórias Espectrais, Arte e Desaparecimento Desaparecimento no pós Adjo Sinapa do México, mexicano. Ah, então, muito obrigado, Mônica, a todo o equipe pela pelo convite. And the first thing Uh, I want to say is that uh, my apologies for not being able to speak in Portuguese. Uh, I like the language and I should be able to speak it. So for the next time, I promise I will be speaking Portuguese. It's a commitment, a public commitment today. So really thank you for, for the organization. Uh, it was difficult, I was traveling quite a lot, but they made a lot of effort to have me here today, and it's, a, it's my pleasure to be here um, in this commemoration of the university. Um, I'm, I'm, I come from Mexico City, where the public university also experienced troubles. So what I hear before in the introduction, uh, this idea of being together, doing what we do as a political, collective act to resist against public institutions is, is really part of our intellectual and uh, militant activity. So I, I, I feel that energy of uh, restructuring your institution. So I'm happy to be part of, of this uh, conference in the middle of these troubles. Um, so I want to thank also the translators because uh, I know it's ridiculous I'm speaking in English. They will be translated into Portuguese and will be no signs, but uh, anyway. Uh, as Monica mentioned, my, the title of my presentation is Spectral Memories, Art and Disappearance in Post Ayotzinapa, Mexico. I know it's difficult to pronounce the name, but I'm gonna explain what is that and what's the issue behind this, this name. So in 2017, the University Museum of Contemporary Art of Mexico, known as MUAC, opened an exhibition entitled Forensic Architecture Towards an Investigative Aesthetics. The show included a variety of projects produced in the last decade by Forensic Architecture, a researching agency directed by British architect Ayal Weisman. This multidisciplinary platform was founded in 2010 as an affiliated project with Goldsmith University of London. The goal of this agency is to investigate cases of state violence and violations of human rights around the world. 
far from bring, far from being an, art, an artistic platform, forensic architecture has been instrumental in judicial processes and political hearings concerning killings, armed conflicts, genocides, and false disappearing, state terrorism, organized crimes, migratory crisis, and etc. Using 3D modeling, database analysis, photogrammetry, and what they call counter forensics, this agency provides official information for the resolution of legal cases. In 2018, Forensic Architecture was nominated for the Turner Prize, the most prestigious Visual Arts British Award conferred by the Tate Gallery. Obviously, Forensic Architecture is perceived as an agency that is much more than, a, than an alternative human rights platform or a field-based academic researching group. The reason for the nomination has to do with the fact that this agency involving architects, researchers, geographers, advocates, software designers, and journalists actively collaborate with museums producing exhibitions all around the world. Crossing disciplines, their projects disrupt traditional conceptions of what is artistic research and what defines political art as such. Not having any artistic expectation, forensic architecture is indeed fully interested in what they call investigative aesthetics, an understanding of visual art, filmmaking, and photography that goes beyond the external production of compassion and empathy. The agency defines the investigative aesthetics in the following way, and I quote, Artists have collaborated with human rights organizations since the birth of the human rights movement in the 70s. Human rights groups made good use of the effective power of the arts in helping steer public compassion, but it sometimes replaced historical and political investigation with accounts of individual tragedies. With several important exceptions, artist work was kept external to and merely illustrative of the actual investiga investigative work. Forensic architecture seeks to shift away from this use of the arts and to employ aesthetic sensibilities as investigative resources." Thing, end of the quote. For them, investigating human rights issues demands an implication of our senses. Instead of illustrating, commenting, denouncing, or supporting the case from the outside, visual arts must be fully embedded in the very act of investigating. Sensing the reality and feeling the evidence are, strictly speaking, researching tools. For I.L. Weissman, and I quote, investigative aesthetics slows down the time and intensifies sensibilities to, sensibility to space, matter, and image. It also seeks to devise new modes of narration in articulating new truth claims, and unquote. In other words, without aesthetics, truth cannot be politically accomplished as res publica. I think in Portuguese you say it the same way, right? A coisa do povo, tá? Sim, yes, coisa pública. In fact, most of, their, most of their projects criticize the idea that we live in a post-truth or post-factual epoch with no capacity to build the architecture of our political, of our politics on evidence and facts. Curators and scholars have noticed that the work of forensic architecture revolves around what Mich Michel Foucault defines as regimes of veridiction, the ethical conundrum of true telling and true seeing. Rather than an objective truth with capital, veridiction reveals the performative of evidence, stimulating our capacity to see and tell truths. In order, in order to do that, forensic architecture has developed a methodology they call counter-forensics, committed to give back the term its original meaning. Forensics, as you know, derives from the Latin root forensis, pertaining to the public. It also connects with forum, which means public place, or the locus to the public. 
It also uh, the locus of the assembly, I'm sorry, a place where people meet to talk and make politics. From this point of view, forensic might be described as a public forum for making political decisions. However, in the everyday language, the term refers to medicine, legality, courts, scientific police, trials, and the state. Today, it is impossible to count the number of TV series using forensics as a statement of sec for security, order, and surveillance. Aware of that, counter-forensics argues that, argues that the power to build truths lies on the civil assembly and the public sensorium, rather than, the, than on the optics of the state. As a disruptive practice, counter-forensics inverts the relation between individuals and states. In I.L. Weisman's words, and I quote, it's a is a counter-hegemonic practice able to challenge and resist state and corporate violence and the tyranny of their truth, unquote. But counter-forensics also means that the general public can investigate governmental actions and state-level institutions. And I quote, while police forensic is a disciplinary project that affirms the power of states, the direction of the forensic gaze could also be used instead to detect and interrupt state violations." Unquote. This was the case in forensic architecture towards an investigative aesthetics, the exhibition I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. For the show, previously displayed in Barcelona, Ayel Weisman included the results of the investigation on the Ayotzinapa case the torture and enforced disappearance of 43 students from the rural normal school located in the Mexican state of Guerrero in, small community, in a small community called Ayotzinapa. The investigation was uh, commissioned by Equipo Argentino de Antropologia Forense, or um, Forensic Anthropology uh, Argentinian team, and the Human Rights Center Miguel Agustin Pro Juarez, known as Centro Pro, a local NGO founded in 1988 in Mexico. The aim was to collect testimonies from perpetrators and victims to organize all this information and to produce a time-based cartography of the events. The result was a series of videos 3D reconstructions of the crimes, and a large-scale mural plotting different versions and narrations of disappearance. Can you see a little bit? Yeah. It's possible to turn this slide off, just the first line. I think it's better there, yeah? Mm -hmm. For those of you unaware of the details of this case, the chronology of the, of the Ayotzinapa's disappearance runs something like this. On the night of 26, 27 September 2014, a group of 80 students from the rural school were intercepted during the preparatory actions for the so-called Dos de Octubre, uh, October the 2nd, the date in which the country commemorates the massacre of students occurring in 1968 in Tlatelolco, Mexico City. In collaboration with state agencies, federal police, the organized crime and the military, a group of local policemen attacked the students, killing two, causing permanent brain damage to one, and detaining and disappearing 43. Immediately after, the Mexican state produced a series of inconsistent narratives resulting in what the federal general attorney bombastically announced as the historical truth, a rhetorical expression condensing the discursive violence of the state. Five years later, the 43 students remain disappear and the Ayotzinapa case continues to be an unresolved state-level crime. However, memory became afterwards a battlefield, transforming the public space into a permanent struggle between governmental amnesia and the politics of truth. Can I see the next one, please? Actually, this is a series of images 
of how people took the case and participate in a, in, a, in a variety of demonstrations that moved from university to trials to the defense of other students and to the political action in different scenarios. Can we see uh, the next one? This is the posters that, you, that used to come to the, to the Camera de Senadores to, to protest. There was an anti-monument, uh, 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 a memorial that is uh, traveling and moving around the city and even uh, abroad. And, and they took this number of the 43 as the icon, as the sign of the demonstration. You can find it now in different places. You can imagine in a political level it was uh, a struggle to put this non-monument in some specific places, like for example, outside the uh, General Assembly in Mexico City and so on. Can we see the next one? This is the, the father, the, 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 the one for please, just a little a second. Uh, families of the victims you know, conducting these manifestations and demonstrations uh, in the city. But uh, there are also artists that have been participating in uh, this uh, appropriation of the project. This is, for example, uh, Luciano Hammer with a piece called uh, level of confidence, and this is a, um, he worked with technology, and what he does is uh, he produced like a face recognition camera that uses biometric um, surveillance algorithms, and when you are in front of the screen, the screen caps your eyes and your face and your, and your facial um, type, and gives you a, an average of which of the 43 people disappear you are the most uh, similar to. With the thing that is never a fully similarity, making evidence that the people still disappear and that you are just part of this community of faces in search of these absent bodies. Can we see next one? This is uh, how. You can go online and try it. You can even download the software and put it in your own screen and use it. It's like a, like a communicational tool. This is another piece from a well-known artist, uh, Ai Weiwei, that has been uh, displayed in the same museum in Mexico City, in the Moac. It's called Reestablishing Memories. And what he did is uh, to use these Legos um, tools for the children and he created these big pictures and then um, digitized them and produced this panel of faces that is very interesting in contrasting with other exercise because he used a strong, colorful uh, level. So he's given to this sad experience a kind of a different level of representation. It also includes a chronology of the events that you can see below these faces, and that you can read uh, uh, testimonies that has been collected uh, for, for many organizations and other artists. Finding new evidence and disrupting the hegemonic narration of the state has become an important ingredient of the social movements that claim for justice and peace. As Ayel Weissman has noticed, and quote, false disappearance is not only an act of violence against people, but also against evidence. It includes the physical destruction of bodies, as well as the destruction of evidence and the fabrication of false narratives, and unquote. The mural produced by forensic architecture reveals the political agenda of the so-called historical truth, forcing the government to recognize and to renegotiate the regime of veridiction of the Ayotzinapa case. The mural is in itself a researching tool, condensing all the information that contradicts the official version, that is, that the students were killed by the local organized crime. Can we see next one? The mural contains useful data 
and contrasted testimonies offering the possibility to build a counter-hegemonic forensic gaze. Echoing the muralist tradition in Mexico, the large panel is a diagram of state terror, a cartography of violence, and an image of disappearance as a narrative form. I know it's hard to see from there, but you can also see it online. You can download the PDF with all the details, and, and you can search the website that they created. Actually, this is part of the, the way they displayed uh, the information with different screens, different tables, that you can be contrasting and moving through the events happen on real time. Next one, please. This is the, web, the website. If you, if you just Google this, uh, this title, uh, Ajotzinapa, a cartography of violence, you can search, you can get all the information. This is part of the maps that they produce, and you can choose, for example, um, one police car, and you can track all the movements of, the, of, of that specific uh, uh, subject, or you can trace a testimony and see how it was perverted once it came to the court, or something like this. It's really a, a multi-level information infographic uh, structure. The next one, please. There's another one, uh, 3D reconstructions and reenactments of the crimes and the scenes and how they were happening, because it was very complex. As I said, was the military involved, was state organizations, and was the local police happening at the same time. And so it was very difficult to collect all the testimonies in order to find how they were acting in uh, collusion. Next one, please. This is another animation of, you can see, it's, it's difficult, but uh, there are the cars, and in red, you have the bodies as they were transported from one place to another, some of them to the hospital, some of them who passed, uh, disappear at some point in this, uh, in this movement. Next one, please. And finally, this is another, another uh, image of how they display this uh, panel in the museum. Affected by systemic violence, massive disappearances, and the lack of accountability, recent contemporary art in, Mexi in Mexico has been experimented with forensic aesthetics. Some artists work with what I call the sensible presence of the absent body, a sort of dislocated existence of the disappeared only experienced as a trace or as an erasure. Culiacan artist Teresa Margolles worked with the absent bodies, assassination, and disappearance. Trained in a criminal forensics, her strategy is to deal with the materiality of violence and death, implying but never representing the missing body. In her work, the body is presented in absentia. In this way, Margolles turns absence into a political and aesthetic territory a territory inhabited by spectral memories. Spectrality and phantasmagoria turned into forensic and aesthetic categories. In her work, we are exposed to the trace of homicides, feminicides, and false disappearance, organized crimes, and extrajudicial executions. Mexico appears as a painful and repulsive reality. We easily find objects related to death murder, and crime scenes. However, something seems to be missing all the time. There is terror, but there are no actual corpses. Fluids, body parts, footprints, others, inscriptions, and other forms of indexical signs are there, but never a corpse as such. Take, for instance, her installation, Sounds of the Dead. 2008, a series of audio, audio recordings registered in locations where female corpses were formed. Captured by the intriguing title of the piece, we immediately realize that the collected sounds have nothing to do with the noises produced during the finding, the examination, or the transportation of the female bodies. Actually, what we are invited to hear has no direct connection with the corpses. We know those corpses corpses were 
uh, at some point in that landscape, but what we hear is just the spectral echo of the body. In searching the body, we are forced to hear the only, to hear only the body only as an absence. In Vuriel from 2000, Margoyes presents a concrete block with an encased fetus. The works elaborates on the materiality and the legality of medical waste. Since silverts are not considered corpses, they are discarded as throwaways. If you get it well, she put inside a fetus. And it implies a lot of legal issues because in some countries, what is a fetus and what is a corpse that who dies, right, depends on the legal normalization on how many weeks you consider as something, as a living entity or just a, as a wasting uh... In pieces such as In the Air, 2003, Margoyes blows water bubbles into the empty rooms, creating a state of calm and a state of calm and joyful. Next one. At some point, visitors realize that the water has been previously used for washing corpses in preparation for the autopsy of people violently killed. It's difficult to see, but there's is, is someone inside that fog. But uh, in vaporization, 2001, Margoyes sprays steam water, also taken from the morgue, in the sprayed fog, and the bubbles resonates the absence of the body. Though there is no visual presence of that, people in the room actually touches, at least indirectly, the remains of that body. Pleasure and joyful suddenly give place to a state of ejection and discomfort. Here, the word autopsy, like forensic, returns to its original meaning. Autopsy derives from the Latin word autopsia, eyewitnessing, or to see something with your own eyes. In both pieces, our gaze witnessed nothing but an absent body. For 36 bodies from 2006, Margoyes recuperates 36 threads used for stitching up bodies after the autopsy. Threads pertain to bodies that suffer violent death as well. Next one. Tied together, the installation creates a silent tension reducing the bodies to a horizontal line in the space. You can, you can come back a little bit. Those threads were used for putting together the body. And once the body disappears, the forensic just get again these lines and create this installation. Looks like bodies holding hands in the middle of the space. Now, please. Embroidered fabric from 2012 is a collaborating project between the artists and a group of indigenous female activists from Guatemala. The work consists of a piece of fabric intervened by this group of women during a series of conversations on community violence and disappearance. Victims of the state terrorist, terrorism and impunity, this woman used traditional embroidering techniques on a piece of fabric that previously served for covering corpses at the morgue. You actually can see all these marks and residual fluids. The result is a map of mass, of mass violence in Guatemala, resulting from the juxtaposition of fluids, blood, erasures, and traditional designs. And it's very interesting, this one, because women are invited to talk about how violence affects them. They are widows because the men would disappear or friends of them disappear. So the process of being together and broadening and thinking on the materiality of violence as a residual thing is part also of the project. 
pesquisa, and it's, it's regional. Uh, we don't say that in Spanish. At, at least it's not so common, but it's the name of the title. Pesquisa from 2016. It's an installation of 30 posters with images of missing women from Ciudad Juarez. Probably you know that in Ciudad Juarez has been happening a massive disappearance of young female uh, people. Margolis photographed these posters over the years interested in the erasures and mutilations of their printed faces. Next one, please. Physical agents such as rain and dust deteriorate the image echoing the way in which the state and the law forget the existence of the missing bodies. Sometimes they manage to get the court, but any of the cases is resolved. So the existence as the papers on the walls slowly began to decolor and to disappear. You can see the next one. There are many. I don't Okay. There are many other pieces that I'm just going to mention briefly. This is called tongue, and it's an exchange that the artist made with a punk young guy who died. So she got that tongue and ex exhibited that as a small treasure. The next one, please. This is called papers. And are actually papers that the artists use to dry a body after the autopsy at the morgue. And she exhibited that as an abstract, even as an expressionist abstract uh, paintings. This is from 2003. Next one, please. This is called PM, and it's a collection. She collected this, this magazine during the whole year is 2011. And a weird thing is that is this kind of magazines that exhibit all the time atrocities and violence and narcotraffic and all that. But this magazine, every three years disappear because they don't collect them. It's a very um, cheap paper and they recycle the paper and reprint it. Uh, for the next year, so it's like uh, an absence of the support as well. Next one is called uh, the wall or shoot at the wall, and in this one also we cannot see the bodies, but we evoke the presence of the bodies that were in front of the wall where the narcotraffic uh, organized crime shoot them and kill them. This is an, an, another, uh, another uh, view of the installation. And in the very rear of the, of the wall, you see Javasta, hijos de puta, that um, <laughs> I don't know how to translate it into Portuguese, but maybe someone can help me. Pare fios da puta. Chega. Yes. So it's really, uh, we are we're really on the limits of acceptance of this massive systematic violence. <clears throat> this is called plancha, like a, like a plate. Scholars argue that there is an inversive correlation between the escalating presence of extreme violence in the public sphere in Mexico and the radicalization of minimalist aesthetics in artists such as Teresa Margolis. The hypothesis suggests that the so-called war on drugs, declared in 2006 by ex-president Felipe Calderon, not only increased the presence of corpses operating as statements in the streets and the media, but also forced artists to find non-representational alternative ways to deal with violence, brutality, and, and bloody crimes. What is at stake in this hypothesis is the potential incapacity of the artistic image to, to communicate extreme situations when the social landscape is so saturated and haunted by the presence of horror. 
Jacques Rancière has characterized the situation as the moral exhaustion of the image, not because images are mere fictions or representations, but rather because there is an excess of reality in the body of the image. This is another, another view of this. The work of artists such as Teresa Margolius reveals the scale of the problem in Mexico. It is not surprising that his solo show of the Venice Biennial in 2000 and now, uh, you know, in, in the Biennial, one artist represents Mexico, so it's like a big uh, political agenda for the country. Uh, I know you, you, you suffer with the same kind of situations. Uh, that exhibition was entitled, What Else Can We Talk About? Most installations included in the show are invitations to think on the materiality of violence as opposed to the immateriality of the absent body. And I don't know if, if some of you saw it, but uh, all the installations were in the same mood as the pieces that I mentioned before. This one, for example, uh, when a people arrived to this, to this pavilion, uh, they found always people washing and, and cleaning up the, the floor. And it is because she took water from Mexican morgues and used it to clean the building on the architectural uh, container in, in the Venice Biennial. So tourism and artists and curators, uh, when they realized they were walking on the remains of bodies that was killed on the other side of the Atlantic, they a chuck. Next one, please. This is also uh, fabrics that, that she used for covering corpses and were exhibited as flags or as uh, abstract paintings uh, on, this, on the walls of this uh, uh, build, historical building, actually covering original uh, paintings and so on. Next one, please. This is a, is a close view of that. If you don't know, it, it could look even an, as aesthetically appealing, right? Once you know that it's a part of a body that is inscribed, yeah, like, a, like a remain, like, like a mark. Right? A, a Chilean uh, art critic said, when you see a mark, you, at some point, or at some, in some part of your brain, you realize that there was a body before the mark, right? Every, every mark is, is a trace that a body was there before. Next one, please. This is how she covered all these uh, historical walls. Next one. They also wave and embroider uh, messages that, uh, organized crimes used to inscribe in bridges and walls in Mexico and they translated into these flags and into these uh, fabrics. As you can see, the flag uh, in, the, in the facade of the building is, has been substituted by this uh, murdering uh, evidence in Mexico. So an artist representing Mexico in the biennial that actually the only things that can talk about is assassination is actually the kind of issue and the kind of spectral violence that I want to uh, discuss today. But the, global foren but the goal of forensic aesthetics is not to produce art, but to find evidence and to use the material presence of human remains for different purposes, such as prosecution, restitution, and mourning. Exhumations come together with what could be described as spectral memories. In removing land, forensic excavations also disrupt the topography of our social memory. I would like to advance at this point the following hypothesis. In an epoch defined by the aesthetics of disappearance and reappearance, the image is not saturated only with reality, as Jacques Rancière suggests, but also with a spectrality. 
photojournalist Fernando. I know this is uh, this is also uh, a message of of the of, of Teresa Margolles. It was a performance. Uh, people took some of these flags and walked on the on the on the on the beaches. This is Fernando Brito, a photojournalist that has been documenting and collecting these specters with his camera, and it's a very interesting extrapolation between artists, contemporary artists, and con contemporary art galleries uh, using photojournalist uh, pictures that originally were part of just the papers and the news, and that suddenly enter into a different kind of exhibitionary complex. We can see a, a couple of them. As you can see, the photograph has been aesthetically uh, produced and, and thought which uh, contradicts the essence of photojournalism, that is just being in, in the moment and capture what the reality gives you. Right? That kind of spectrality, that kind of massive and systematic violence requires another kind of level of representation. You can see another one with drones, and you see these uh, bodies. Unlike Teresa Margolles, Fernando's Britos is always focused on the body uh, resting on the floor. This is it. Over images, the artistic ones included, are inhabited by specters, Our memories have been erased and written back by the presence of the missing bodies. Massive and false disappearances have produced a sort of spectral violence inflicted on the social body as a whole. Unlike other forms of terror, a spectral violence impact, impacts the social body indirectly, using the phantasmagorical presence of disappeared bodies as an instrument for its own incarnation and somatic reproduction. Official numbers concerning missing bodies in Mexico are actually disturbing. As you probably know, a couple of months ago, it was officially declared that there are more than 3,000 clandestine graves in Mexico. The territory shall be described as a national graveyard. In only 10 years, more than 5,000 full bodies have emerged. And I say full bodies because Found are 5,000, but most of the remains are just pieces of bodies that you cannot actually count as disappeared people because you only have part of a finger bone or just a teeth, and they don't count, right? Even if you just get the body without the head, you cannot count that in that list. So it's a massive emergence of um, spectral bodies because of the, of the drugs and wars and the dirty war that happened in the, in the 70s and 80s. In front of this situation, counter forensics appears as an alternative for dealing with disappearance and phantasmagoria. As I said before, the massive presence of human remains dislocates not only the geography of pain, but also the visual arena in which the right to see for ourself and the right to know the truth become a literal struggle to the dead with institutional impunity, administrative erasure, and spectral memory. We are facing a new form of violence characterized by the spectral materiality of the absent body. This is why I argue that the scopic regime of violence in Mexico is reaching today a point of inflection. In fact, the very idea of excavating memories evokes a series of visual technologies fully connected with what has been discussed here as counter forensics. I don't know if you can recognize what is that, but it's people and uh, families of the victims trying to find the remains, right? Uh, if we accept the idea that forensic means giving to the public the capacity to see and to find truths, 
families, organizations, non-for-profit uh, groups has started to uh, search formally their bodies and their, and their absent families. Let me conclude quoting again Ayel Weisman. An important component, he said, in our ability to respond to political challenges is the capacity of forensics to move beyond detecting, calculating, processing, and presenting acts of injustice, achieving a heightened aesthetic state of, materiali of material sensibility tuned to weak signals must be enhanced by a sensibility to the materiality of politics. This entails an appreciation that whether you are a building, a territory, a pixel, or, or a person, to detect is to transform, and to be transformed is to feel pain. Thank you very much. Nós só temos como agradecer ao professor Barriandos né, por esse momento tão importante de reflexões. Ele abre uma série de questões que eu imagino que vocês gostariam de comentar ou perguntar. Mas... Ainda temos... Uh, eu gostaria só, inicialmente, fazer um, uma pergunta. Né? Depois eu gostaria de abrir, porque eu imagino que devem existir várias questões. Uh, professor Barrianos, tem uma parte da sua conferência em que uh, você fala que este, movi esta, este movimento, esta proposta não busca a, pró a própria arte, mas não é? a estende a outras questões. Então, a minha pergunta seria uh, como você vê mesmo essa questão? Como, como a arte se coloca? Porque tudo que foi mostrado envolve a arte. Então, essa é uma pergunta. <risos> Não sei se tenho a resposta, mas vou ensaiar. I think it's not rejecting art. It's just not the goal to produce artistic artworks. Is uh, trying to deal with art as not different from politics, on from what Rancière says, the political. It's a different politics from the political. And what he said is um, every kind of artwork is always involved in a context of politics and actually is inaugurated as a political issue by the senses, by sensing the world, by sensing reality. She, he explicitly said that the political emerge exactly in that moment in which I say, no, I feel that different. This is not my feeling. We don't have a common sense on that. It's in that moment when the political appears because we have to deal with that difference of the sensorium, right? This is what he calls the division of the sensible. Right? I don't know how they translate it into Portuguese. In Spanish, they made it a little bit bad. Uh, uh, but is uh, is the dissensual could be the, the correct word. To dissent, to dissenso, see? Dissenso, using senses as literally going through from the middle through, this, through the common sense. This is the moment in which something is political. And art is always that. Art is always dividing us sensually. So art is always political. So the point is not to look for a kind of world that operates in a system, but to act politically 
in the aesthetic field. So from that point of view, the problem is not the art. The problem is looking for something that looks like art that in a way heightens what the political really is. Esta sua pergunta já é um, algo que se pode continuar desenvolvendo e certamente gerará estudos seus, certamente muitos que estão ouvindo, eu, com certeza. Eu gostaria de dividir as questões com o público, porque eu imagino que vários estão refletindo a respeito, não é? Uh, thank you very much for your brilliant lecture. It really moved me very much to see all these artistic pieces. But I would like to ask, as it's so extreme, so many artists are like focusing on this issue, is it, does it develop some kind of pressure on the justice system or the, uh, like, uh, that the investigations on this Corps are took, taken more seriously, so is there any relating relation between it nowadays? Or does it just is it just two worlds which which don't attach to each other? Uh, I think in Mexico it's just starting. Something is different now. The conversation in the public space is different now. And pretty much, it's not the only case, but that case emerged as the icon of something because of the way it was perpetrated. Right? It was so violent, it was so obvious that it was very well organized people, very familiar with crime, extreme torture, who disappeared these this young students. Right? It was so extremely violent right? that for the general public, suddenly the spectral balance that is behind was sent and projected to the very everyday life. So I think now we are awaking from the shock and then things start to happen. But justice is, is the most resistant, the most consolidated system of defense, right? So to escalate this to the, to the judi judicial level is a slow and is painful and is expensive, right? And what was interesting in this forensic architecture project is that they collaborate with a lot of uh, advocating organizations and actually they were commissioned by one organization uh, to provide this information. So it's like a haunting how the law has been an instrument of protection for this historical truth. Right? What we don't have yet fully developed in Mexico is uh, museums and park of memories or site of conscience uh, or museum of, of the human rights. We have a couple of them, but they are not the result of a conversation with the Civics, civil society. They, they were created vertically from upside down. And they start to establish slowly, but it's just the beginning of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the situation is not easy. With the new government, you know, we have a, a, a new uh, a president, Jago, and he passed something that is It's gonna be a problem. He changed something that is called uh, Ley de Seguridad Interna, like internal security law. And it's really complex, but the most problematic issue there is that military actions in the civil space will not be accounted as civic civilian act, but military actions. So general attorneys will not be able to judge the, those actions. 
And this is because he wanted to get in better local policy, so use militars to become police, right? So he has to change the law in order to make them possible to be at that level of public service, which seems at the beginning like a good idea because our police is the, the worst, literally the worst in the world. But uh, the military there, it's going to be the, the opposite, will be the corruption of the military regime, not the purification of the police because of the, of the, of the militars on the streets. So it's a law that passed that, that is operating now, right? You can see that with the migrants crossing from Central America to Mexico, you know, these caravanas migrantes. That new military regime is the one that is blocking, persecuting, and, and torturing these uh, migrants in the, in, the, in the south border of Mexico. So it's a complex situation. It's not going to be solved easily. Thank you very much. Alguém gostaria de colocar alguma questão especial? Eh, mi pregunta en realidad es bastante simple y es ¿por qué estás hablando en inglés? <risa> si somos países hermanos y estamos acá para hablar de cómo estamos apagando nuestra propia historia y estamos hablando de eso en inglés y recién ahora hablamos sobre los negros sin un negro presente. No tengo respuesta para darte. Más yo voy a responder solo un momento. É que este colóquio é internacional e nós temos na audiência pessoas que vieram, especialmente que não falam português, não entendem espanhol. É por isso que nós tivemos muita dúvida sobre isso. Mas compreendemos, temos que ter também o respeito às pessoas que vieram. Então, ele é uma parte traduzida, uma parte não. Desculpe. Eu venha com o texto no espanhol. Ela, ela, ela me ligou e me disse, não, Joaquim, você tem que falar em inglês. Eu tradu, tra, traduz, traduz uma, uma, para mim, à uh, noite. <risos> e essa é a razão. Pero, pero tienes razão em tu, em tu preocupação. Por isso eu dizia que era ridículo que eu em inglês. Además, suena feio. Boa tarde, muito obrigada pela sua brilhante explanação. Eu fiquei com uma questão que ela diz respeito a, a sua uma fala a, de, de agora há pouco, né? Onde tu falaste que alguns artistas buscam algo que pareça arte. Né, para aproximar, vamos dizer, vamos dizer assim, essa produção da, da esfera política ou atingir o sensível. Né. Sobre essas últimas obras que foram uh, mostradas da artista que expôs os tecidos que foram uh, usados para envolver os corpos né, de mortos, e sobre a questão ali do, do espaço aonde o um espaço museológico né que foi limpo e que era constantemente limpo uh, com água proveniente de da limpeza de cadáveres né uh, gostaria de saber uh, se estas obras ou essas ações colocadas em outros espaços que não fossem museológicos ou que não fossem eh, galerias, que não fossem espaços institucionalizados de arte, você chamaria de arte? Ou 
ou atribuiria a, a essas obras uh, esse status, vamos dizer assim? Muito obrigada. Uma pergunta ontológica. Impressionante, né? só eu vou fazer uma, só uma observação. Uh, Sim. Impressionante a sua colocação e eu teria outras perguntas mas impressionante a sua colocação sobre, a, sobre essa questão da violência né? no México, eu não tinha ideia disso. E impressionante também a nossa familiaridade no Brasil atual com esse tema. Muito obrigada. Obrigado. obrigado. Eu tenho mais uh, casos no Chile, no Brasil, na Argentina, mas precisava ficar mais, mais conciso né? para explicar... Né? na loucura no México. Uh, the question of... I, I would say that naming something art is always an external imposition. So, I wouldn't, but the problem is, is not that I'm calling that art is always naming that as art is is a, is a, is is the way in which violence conforms something as part of a system so of course the gallery the museum has established a system for naming that as art going to the biennial getting the turner prize is is the way that uh, ontological stabilization happens uh, and that can happen on the street. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a problem of the container. It's a problem of uh, the, the, the forces, the kind of power or the micropolitics that name that thing in that situation as art. And we see it all today everywhere. Uh, things that 25 years ago looked like not being part of the system because they were expelled to the outside of the museum in the 60s and 70s, it was very clear uh, in Brazil. Uh, art is rejecting these institutions and rejecting the names in which these disciplines happen to be with the prizes and juries and whatever. Now, 40 years later, they act in the same way and they can be inside or, or outside. Conceptual art practices that rejected the museum has been collected and now are in the museum. Is that bad? No. Is it what implies to be named at some point as art or not? It's like the structure that makes the structure of something as art or the possibility that something to avoid the objectualization of art in, in a specific situation. I don't know if, if I were clear with that, but um, yeah, see? There was a debate in the 60s on the, on the dematerialization, right? Mario Pedrosa, uh, Fico in, 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 this, in this discussion and Frederico Moraes também participou. And, and the problem was not the antagonism between the concept or the object, but how values interact between the physicality and the materiality and the, ob and the object and the social context in which that acts as art or not. Uh, oi, não é bem uma pergunta, acho que seria mais um comentário. Uh, eu tenho alguma relação ambígua uh, referente ao último artista que mostrou, não me lembro o nome, que tinha. Isso. Tenho relações ambíguas com esse tipo uh, de exposição do corpo, mas o que eu queria comentar é sobre a obra da Tereza. 
Porque ela tem o um, um forte nela, é, tem essa questão do elemento surpresa, que quando você está no meio já, respirando, e que você descobre né, que então aqueles corpos já estão em você depois que você entrou em contato. E eu já tive a oportunidade de ver uma obra fisicamente numa das bienais do Mercosul, aqui. E era uma mesa e dois bancos com a construídos com água de necrotério aqui. E, e fico pensando nesse o elemento surpresa de descobrir que o corpo está em outros invólucros. Uh, um, não consigo não pensar na nossa história no Brasil, já que esse era um dos argumentos para o genocídio e a escravização indígena, primeiramente com o argumento oficial religioso de que aqueles corpos não tinham alma. Então, por serem apenas corpos, eles podiam ser subjugados, submetidos a qualquer espécie de né, tortura. Enfim. E, e olhando mais especificamente a, a obra do, de Veneza, da, da Teresa, do, como se fosse um tapete de, de sangue, Uh, penso no, como uma espécie de retribuição. A artista, olha, estamos aqui retribuindo, então, né, um tapete de sangue que já é nosso, mas a gente também... Enfim. E, e lembro também de um relato muito forte que eu uh, vi num, fi, num documentário em que falava o Ailton Krenak, um historiador indígena do povo Krenak, que disse que nos primeiros as primeiras décadas após a, a invasão, como a nossa costa é gigantesca, a primeira coisa foi o, o cuidado que os índios costeiros né, do litoral tiveram, porque os portugueses chegavam praticamente mortos pela, pela, pela condição das viagens, e eles, durante muito tempo, cuidaram, medicaram, e curaram essas pessoas e aí aos poucos que a coisa foi acontecendo então esse elemento surpresa para mim no trabalho da Teresa ele me parece muito mais forte e, e realmente estar na presença do trabalho dela é, é algo assim super estranho I agree with with everything uh, I have the same feeling with Fernando Britos And he's not the only one, he's, he's, he's a group of people now in Mexico working in that static level of photojournalism. And there's a, like transfers between them and sometimes they, they have very clear um, explanations or justifications on why they are doing it. But sometimes they just, professionally they change, right? Suddenly, You know, photo press and photo biennials emerge everywhere, and this kind of photo photos are bought and circulated. So it's, it's also a, a real professional issue, but uh, I have the same feeling. I like them, but uh, something is too much, it's an excess of reality, if, 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 if I uh, keep on, on, my, on my own explanation. But about the surprise, uh, I think that is interesting that the, the kind of surprise that you get is not a rational one, right? You get, for example, with this Cadeira Imesa, and you can sit, right? And then your body is in contact with that. But you don't know. When you read the cartela, you are contaminated already. So you are surprised of the fact that your body knew before you, you realized that you were participating in this circulation of fluids and that. This is what, it's, it's, it's not an external surprise, it's a surprise in within the subject that suddenly breaks in parts inside. Because your body has been, you smell, the other is inside yourself, and you can do anything. You just breath, and that is inside yourself, as is always, right? 
is like a, the, the, the fracture of subjectivity. She works with that. So the surprise is not, oh, God, I'm walking on that. No, is that your body knew it and you just as a zombie, as an inspector, just continue doing it until your brain read it and you made a connection with yourself. Yeah. This is the kind of surprise that is embedded in Teresa's work, which is a, another level of being surprised by yourself, by your, your own ignorance. That way, sensing evidence is so important for I.L. Weissman because there's something there in paying attention with your body uh, uh, to reality as it emerged in collaboration with your subject, right? with your subjectivity. Not only calculating, not only... Uh, but I agree, I agree. Tem ainda alguma pergunta? Se não, nós vamos finalizar. Ô, oh, Rodrigo. Que tal? Dá para ouvir? Então, tá. Então, eu vou fazer em português. Vou fazer em espanhol, vou ficar no, no português para né, compartilhar. Um, Jean-Luc Deot fala da era do desaparecimento como a era em que se forma uma comunidade especial em torno, ou de afeto em torno dessa figura do desaparecido né? um, que é uma sensibilidade que surge em torno a partir do familiar principalmente, primeiro o familiar que passa a lidar com um tipo inesperado e inédito para ele de ausência, principalmente pelo que é a interdição da morte né? é uma morte que não se conclui que, na verdade, não, aliás, nem começa porque foi interditado o corpo. Né? E aí eu fico pensando nesse papel da arte, né? um, enquanto propagadora dessa sensibilidade para o resto do corpo social, tornar aquele afeto que tem uma implicância política, porque essa viés político que faz, digamos, que, que dá lugar à doutrina do desaparecimento, né? uh, mas que dá efeitos no universo íntimo, e que desse universo íntimo precisa sair para a rua. Né? E aí tem toda uma questão de prática da imagem, que se torna uma prática da arte, eu acho que você, no sentido do Regis Debré fala naquele origem da primeira imagem que entra consigo a pulsão da arte. E aí, nesse caso, eu fico pensando, queria te perguntar sobre que tipo de intervenções de tipo artístico, poderíamos chamar, acontecem na rua, além ou prática da imagem, como aquelas fotografias ampliadas, né me lembro, por exemplo, na Argentina, a questão dos familiares desaparecidos também, ampliando as imagens, né? e num ato que um, um teórico não tinha falado de colocar o corpo, poner o corpo em espanhol, que tem toda uma, uma carga de representação substitutiva, né, nesse caso. Isso por um lado. Qual é o tipo de, de, de manifestações que acontecem em termos artísticos na rua? Né? E, por outro, nessa ideia de expandir um pouco essa sensibilidade. Né? E, por outro, um, eu fico pensando um pouco essa, esse tipo de, de grandes exposições, até que ponto não, se, não contribuem, por outro lado, também, a repente, a isso que se fala de tanatoturismo. Né? Isso é uma questão de ir lá para uma de shows de horrores, né? que eu acho que é o que quebra um pouco essa... Você falava da questão de ser numa galeria ou ser fora. Numa galeria, talvez, convoque a esse show de horrores. E, na rua, a pessoa não está indo a buscar aquilo. De repente, isso é colocado na nossa frente, isso atravessa a nossa, nossa frente e produz outro tipo de perturbação. Então, não sei se poderia falar um pouco a respeito disso no México. I think none of none of the of the exhibitions that happen at MOAC, the Iowa Way and the Forensic Architecture, any of them are uh, pornographic in, in, in the sense that showing the balance. The, you see no balance in the, uh, the balance is it, it happening as a spectral element of the information. And, 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 I, and I think that it's because they are aware of the, what you mentioned, uh, the eye looking for, for the body, uh, the pain, right? And it's exhausted. The eye is rejecting that. And I think they develop new strategies to deal with uh, how to touch physically and somatically uh, the acknowledging of the problem without this uh, 
that's why Britos is problematic because it's still in the in the body and in the painful as a representation of of looking empathy and compassion. But uh, Ai Weiwei was actually um, the guy came and talked with the families and he spent a lot of time with them. And so when the exhibition happened, it's not that first happening the show at the, at the museum and then operates on the streets. No, the exhibition in the museum was just a small part of a permanent demonstration in which this photograph, this portrait, this actively being poner el cuerpo, being with the body, is all the time. They, they are all, every single day, looking for the, for, for the, for the people, uh, asking justice, right? And the museum could be a place if you manage these elements properly, right? Also could be a place of perversion, definitely, but everywhere could be a perversion of, uh, of our strategies, right? Inside a museum, at home, every, everywhere, it's no safety place, yeah? Every, every, every situation is a political situation, right? In the museum, yeah, but outside is the same. The street is the same. Yeah. In the street, is the, I don't like the idea of the public sphere as this liberal, uh, traditional uh, place in which we all communicate and, and everyone understands the other. I, I don't like that. This is, the, the, this is a sociological invention that never happened, actually, right? It's a struggle, and, and, and you have to deal with interferences and, and political issues. It's a place in which the political opens from within, right? And the museum is part of that. It's not, a, it's not an autonomous place. That also never happened. So uh, everywhere is a risk. Um, and sometimes you have bridges between them. Sometimes you have bridges. Ainda uma pergunta, porque nós vamos ter que encerrar, mas se tiver alguém que queira ainda fazer uma pergunta, nós depois vamos encerrar. Não? Bom, uh, querido Barriendos, uh, não foi apenas uma conferência, mas o desdobramento das, com as perguntas, não é? Estamos todos pensando em muitas questões, até conceituais, muitas questões para pensar a arte, a experiência, uma série de questões que, com certeza, vamos levar. Muito obrigada pela excelente contribuição para todos nós. Muito obrigada.